Thanks for uh, making your way out in the uh, slightly snowy weather, and thanks to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, didn't want to brave the roads, and so you're enjoying your nice warm room right now. So uh, thanks for uh, being with us uh, this morning. Hey, if you have your Bibles or smart devices, please turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to get to Exodus in just a moment, but I uh, wanted to lay a bit of a foundation for us uh, this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10 says this. We're jumping right in today. Finally, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so you may be able to stand your ground on the evil day and having done everything to stand. So the battles that we face don't begin in the physical. They actually have their origins in the unseen and the spiritual. It's not flesh and blood. It's not that person, like whoever that person is that bugs you from time to time. That is not the origination of all of your spiritual warfare. Something much deeper than that. Right, the rulers, powers, spiritual forces of evil. When we get this right, when we understand that this is the nature of the battle that we face in our life, every single battle, um, it's like the curtain is pulled back. Anybody ever seen Wizard of Oz? Right, the curtain is pulled back, revealing this wizard, sort of, kind of a charlatan, right? He's back there in the back, but the curtain being pulled back reveals it, that that's what's been uh, kind of pulling the uh, forces there. That's exactly what happens with us, when we understand what's actually going on behind the curtain. And uh, the battles are in the realm of influences, ideologies that are opposed to Christ, and really that general sinfulness of humanity that we all face on a daily basis. It's what drives the enemies of God uh, to oppose the life of Jesus. Okay, First John, if you want to flip over to the right just a little bit uh, from uh, where you were, First John chapter 3, verse 7 and 8 says this, Little children, don't let anyone deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And I love this last sentence here in, in 1 John 3, verse 8. For this purpose... The Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. So even here in this scripture verse from the New Testament, we actually see two uh, different, uh, different sides of what's going on uh, behind the scenes, so to speak. Behind righteousness is Jesus. This is a good thing. Okay? Behind that aspect, this is a good thing. Jesus is there. The King of Kings the Lord of Lords, the one who defeated death, hell, and the grave. That's who's behind righteousness. Behind sin is the devil. Quick aside, um, in our world today, there are those who don't believe that evil, devil, you know, that kind of thing, spiritual forces of evil, that they say do not exist. I'm here to tell you <laughs> what's revealed in Scripture and what we believe is that there is a very real devil there is very real evil in our world. And so don't ever underestimate that. But that sin, behind, or behind sin, which is the devil, don't ever, or underneath that influence is what's being revealed here. It's a stark choice because we are bent towards sin. Revealed from the first pages of the Bible that that's our tendency within us is we, we like sin. It appeals to a certain part of our fallen nature, and we like that. However, we understand that we don't need to live in that sin, and Jesus has come to make our lives straight, to, to be in alignment with him, so that sin is no longer our master. We don't have to live in sin. So our struggle is not flesh and blood, but it's this underneath influence of the enemy whose only job it is, is to deceive. The enemy wants to deceive us. The enemy wants to pull us away from righteousness and godliness. Remember, Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, 
So as we get to our next part in Exodus, I wanted to start there so that we would have at least uh, some sort of foundation for us uh, to be able to understand what's actually happening in this part of the book of Exodus. And uh, last week at the burning bush, God revealed himself to Moses, revealed his name to Moses. When Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Uh, God answers in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, you must say to the Israelites, I am um, has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, you must say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial from generation to generation. So God reveals himself as I am that I am. God identifies himself with the phrase that focuses on this one declaration. That, that phrase, I am. God is the absolute of all being. He is the ground out of which everything else proceeds. With, without God, nothing else exists. He is the eternal, the everlasting, the God above all gods. From him is life and breath. There is none like him, none beside him. He exists solely because he is God. All others who claim such are imposters and thieves and liars. But the liars, these charlatans, these thieves, are real in the sense that they are also seeking the hearts of humanity. But God's biggest concern is our heart. He wants all of us, right? And this is the battle that we, be, uh, that we began with. We talked about in, the, in Ephesians and the battle that ensues as Moses leads Israel out of Egypt in the book of Exodus. The I am, the king of kings, right? The I am is about to do battle with those forces of evil that are posing as powers and those powers are longing to be worshipped. You realize that, right? We're always in a battle for what we worship. Always a battle for that. And uh, this battle actually is extended to our time as well. This is not just a, you know, ancient thing that went on with the idols and the gods of Egypt. This is where we are today. Those same gods are trying to get our attention. So from this point, the story moves toward the actual exodus of Israel out of Egypt. But Pharaoh does not want to lose his labor force. I mean, he had control of this entire nation. And so he doesn't want them to go, and so he's doing everything he can uh, to keep Israel there. And so there's this series of interactions between Moses and Pharaoh, and we know that Aaron is there as well. Each interaction seems to build upon the other and culminates in a final battle of sorts, grounded in the unseen realm, but most definitely felt in the physical world around. So at work here is a look at the underpinnings of idolatry that has taken over a culture. That's what happened in Egypt. And I would argue we see it all around us today as well. Remember that the spiritual forces of evil long for influence, and they long to receive worship if they can deceive people and turn their hearts away from the I am and toward themselves. So in Egypt, it took the form of these physical idols, gods that they would set up, they would build shrines to, and it showed up uh, in a physical way that they would then worship these various gods. The I am, Yahweh, he takes issue with this, and one by one, the true God dismantles the foundation of idol worship in Egypt. The way we know this is because in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, and we're going to get to this in just a moment as well, but at the very end of, of this moment, right before the 10th plague comes, it says this, and on all the gods of Egypt, this is God talking, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. In there real quick, anytime you're reading your Bible and you see all the, see the word Lord in all capital letters, uh, I'm spelling it out there as if you knew what I was doing. Okay, <laughs> right, it's all capital letters, and I should have been like this for you, D. Okay, 
Um, but uh, when, whenever you see that, that's actually the word or the name Yahweh is what that is. And so anytime you see all capital letters, that's the name Yahweh. And so he says at the end of that, he says, I am. Once again, this is who he is. I am. I exist. And I am the, I am the God. Right? So he says, I am the Lord. Again, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. These gods were to be defeated one after the other after the other. And in the process of this, the true God, the great I am, is elevated as all-powerful, as worthy himself to be praised and worshipped. So Exodus chapter 7 through Exodus chapter 12, these plagues are listed. And we can go ahead and go to that slide. Uh, There's a slide here. It's complicated. It's got a lot of information on there. And I know I saw some people in first service taking a picture of it. You're welcome to do the same thing if you want to study it a little bit more. But what is happening in the plagues? Remember, God is going to exact judgment on all the gods of Egypt These are many of the gods of Egypt, not not every one of them listed here, but these are many of the gods of Egypt. On the left-hand side, you see listed the 10 different plagues that were put upon the nation of Israel. On the right-hand side, you see different gods that were represented uh, by these various plagues, and it's like God is doing battle against the gods of Egypt. And the great thing is, is God and every one of them is absolutely victorious. And so over the god of Nile, a goddess of the Nile, Isis, that God is able to be over that god. Over the god uh, dealing with the frogs that came out of the Nile River. Over that god, God is powerful and defeats that god, saying, I've got power and authority over you. Um, If these ten plagues represent direct, direct attacks on the Egyptian gods, and it seems to be the case, remember exactly what God said it was, um, what was the effect on Pharaoh and the nation of, of, uh, of Egypt? What was the effect? Because that's kind of what matters then is how does this play out in the nation? What is the result of this attack on the gods of Egypt? As the worship of each god is dismantled, how did Pharaoh deal with it? So let's take a look at that. Let's see what Pharaoh did. Um, and on this slide... Complicated as well. There's a lot going on here. But starting at the top, this is after the very first plague, uh, which was the, the water turned to blood in the River Nile. At the very end of it, and so Pharaoh's heart remained hard, and he refused to listen. At the end of the second plague, it says, he hardened his heart and did not listen to them. At the end of the third plague, but Pharaoh's heart remained hard. Fourth plague, but Pharaoh hardened his heart. Fifth, but Pharaoh's heart remained hard. We get to the the next one, it says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not listen to them. The next plague, uh, so Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He did not release the Israelites, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. He was not willing to release him. There's a pattern here. And what we see in this is a big picture for us today. God is concerned with the heart. Pharaoh is in the position of all authority over all of Egypt. He's in that position, the way that Pharaoh goes or the way that Pharaoh's heart goes, so goes the entire nation. And I would say the same thing could be true of us as well. The way our heart goes, the same goes or the same direction our entire life will take. This is why God is concerned with the heart. Because he understands this represents all of who we are. Back in the Old Testament, it was that way. Back in the New Testament as well, that's the way. And today we talk about you know the heart of the matter. If you want to get down to the middle of all of it, underneath it all, it's dealing with the heart. This is what God is most concerned with. So as the heart of Egypt, or I'm sorry, as the heart of Pharaoh goes, so goes Egypt, and his heart was hard. He's continually refusing to bend his will to God. Instead, he wants to try to figure out a way to continue to worship the next God, and the next God, and the next God, and the next God. But God, every time, is knocking down those idols, knocking down the worship of those other gods. Hopefully you see in this a subtle but very important insight from, uh, from that list. Can you go back to that list real quick? Um, the, uh, the, yeah. There's, a, there's a, a change that happens 
Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then it says, then the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. All that God is doing is responding to the thing that Pharaoh has already done. Right? God is saying, you want your heart to be hard? I'm going to show you what a hardened heart looks like. Pharaoh had already made this decision in his own life before God acts upon his heart. God is only confirming the hardened heart that Pharaoh has already chosen. There's an author from a number of years ago. His name is Eric Fromm, and he is certainly not a, uh, not a theologian, but he wrote in this book called You Shall Be As Gods. Very interesting name. Uh, but he says this, and I, I really agree with what he says here. He says, every evil act tends to harden man's heart. That is, to deaden it. The more man's heart hardens, the less freedom he has to change, the more he is determined already by previous action. What I have found in my own life, and this certainly was true of me when I was much younger, but even today, because I'm not perfect, I, I told first service, I made a big mistake in first service last week. Um, I said it was uh, Pharaoh's wife, the queen, who picked up Moses out of the water, and it wasn't. It was the daughter, but I corrected it by second service. You would not have known that had I not told you right now, but I'm confessing to you my fallibility as your pastor. Um, but, uh, but I know this to be true in my own life, that in times when I know what to do, right, I know the right thing to do, and I choose not to do it, even if it's small things, Man, there's a, there's a bit of hardness that begins to build up in your heart. And when you're not judged immediately for it, what happens? That hardness builds even deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is what's going on in Pharaoh's heart. This, can, this is a condition we may find ourselves in as we fight against God, which is what's happening every time we harden our hearts. We can point to Pharaoh and perhaps see ourselves in the story, because it's hard to give up the sense, our own sense of power and control, which is what's happening to Pharaoh and happens to us. Right? God was dealing with these spiritual forces of evil, these God after God after God after God. God is knocking them down. And as that's happening, Pharaoh is losing more and more and more control. And he's floundering, trying to figure out, how do, I, how do I gain control? How do I put myself in a position on the throne of my life and on my throne for my kingdom? How do I make sure that it doesn't, uh, doesn't falter and fall, and I'm going to go to the next God and to the next God and to the next God until they are all gone? It's hard to surrender, folks. It's incredibly hard to surrender. The final plague is perhaps most devastating. After a period of darkness with all the people of Israel and Egypt in their homes. And the interesting thing about the plagues uh, is that as they go on, uh, there's a distinction between Israel and Egypt. And it becomes greatest as we get to this tenth and final plague, and it's the most devastating of the plagues on the nation of, uh, of Egypt. And God continues to bring this distinction between his people and those who are serving other gods. This is the final battle, and for Israel, it is the first act of faith in this entire narrative. It's the first time as they get to this 10th plague that there is a responsibility, a partnership between God and between the nation of Israel for them to act upon. Exodus chapter 11, beginning at verse 4. This is what the Lord has said. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt will die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the slave girl who's at her handmill and all the firstborn of the cattle. There will be a great cry throughout the whole land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But against any of the Israelites, not even a dog will bark against either people or animals, so that you may know that the Lord distinguishes between Egypt and Israel. In that list of plagues and the gods that they were fighting, or that God was fighting against, the very last one is this final plague. And uh, in, in many times, the nation of Egypt 
the son of Pharaoh was actually considered a god. And in a final blow to the nation of, of Egypt, in a final blow to Pharaoh, this battle hits home. And it's devastating upon the nation of Egypt. And for Israel, though, the distinction is made clear in what follows. And this is something called Passover. Now, we're familiar with this idea of Passover as we get closer to Easter, because Passover is basically, um, the, basically the supper, or during the time of the supper that Jesus was celebrating with his disciples that we call the Last Supper, and we now commemorate that in communion. So communion, every time we do this, this is really what is behind it. This is what's underneath it. This is that spiritual level of what's going on every time we celebrate communion. So for Israel, this distinction is what's called the Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 3. And I'm going to be reading through verse 13, but not reading all of it because there's a lot of details that, um, that I'm going to be skipping over. But it says this, beginning at verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel, on the tenth day of this month, they must each They each must take a lamb for themselves, according to their families, a lamb for each household. Your lamb must be perfect, and then the whole community of Israel will kill it around sundown. They will take some of the blood and put it on the two side posts and the top of the doorframe of the houses. I will pass through the land of Egypt in the same night, and I will attack all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both of humans and of animals. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And it says this, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, so that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this plague will not fall on you to destroy you when I attack attack the land of Egypt. What separates Israel from Egypt? It's the blood. What is the sign of Yahweh's ultimate victory over the gods of Egypt? It's the blood. What finally softens the heart of Pharaoh so that he lets the people of Israel go? It's the blood. Now, truth be told, that the Pharaoh hardens his heart again against Israel uh, as Israel is leaving. But this, which is the blood, that is, that is put by faith over the doorposts um, of, the, of the people of Israel. It is this distinction between the people of God and the people of Egypt that reveals the power, the authority, and the sovereignty of God. It is their faith in the covering of blood. God longs for our heart. This is what God's been doing against Pharaoh this entire time. This is what God does for us all the time. But there's a problem. The gods of this age can gain a foothold in each one of our lives. It happens pretty subtly. Right? The gods of this age want to influence us, want to draw our worship away from the true God, and the gods of this age take different forms than what they did for the nation of Egypt so long ago. Like Pharaoh, we can harden our hearts against what God wants that is best for our life. But what changes everything? What is the one thing that God has provided for us to have a right relationship with? What's the one thing that's been given to us that ultimately defeats all the gods and all the idols and anything else that desires the worship of our lives? It's the blood of the Lamb. It's His blood alone that covers us. Now, um, Jesus is the Lamb. Uh, in the book of John, John the Baptist, he, uh, he points to Jesus as he's walking along the River Jordan. He points and he draws attention to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Right? And so some of you who are brand new to faith, maybe you're, you're new to Life Church and some of the songs that we sing, and from time to time, 
I'm going to fill you in from time to time. Maybe this helps you. Time to time we sing a song and it mentions the blood of the lamb. This is what it's talking about. Is this story that ties into the fact that Jesus is the lamb. And if you look at the dates when this, you know, when this would happen for the nation of Israel, this corresponds directly to the time when Jesus died on the cross. This is the story of Passover. This is our story. Because when the blood of the Lamb, when the blood of Christ is applied to our life, when we by faith receive Jesus, it represents the defeat of all of the gods in our life that long for control over us. Because remember, the entry to our lives is our heart. Right? That this, is, this is where it all takes place. And the blood of Christ can be applied to that doorway as well. The big question. Will we trust Jesus with our life? Another question tied into this. What gods have we allowed to influence our lives? That's a heavy question but it's a real one that each one of us has to deal with. Is it greed? I was uh, out at the, uh, uh, the prayer wall out there and just kind of flipping through and praying for folks uh, this morning before first service. And one of those on there was an individual praying for somebody for whom greed had taken over. And like God break that, that greed in their life. Greed is an idol. Right? Greed is something that puts itself in the place of God. Um, is, it the, is it yourself on the throne? Have you become your own idol? That you're in control of everything and you've got it all figured out. God, don't tell me what I can't and can do. Is it pornography? Is that what has risen to the top in your life and that controls you when the light goes out? That's the first thing. But underneath that even, underneath that action of pornography, underneath that is actually lust. Right? That's, that's what drives that, that spirit of lust. Is there bitterness that controls? There's distractions to the point of forgetting God. I'm reaching into my back pocket. Right? This can become such a distraction for us. So many things can be put on the throne where God alone should sit. Yahweh, where the great I am shall alone occupy. I invite you to stand to your feet this morning. So today, what are we going to do about this? Today is the day to reject those gods that are ultimately powerless and to turn to the one and only true God. He's the only one that actually cares about your heart, the very center of who you are. He's the only one that actually cares about your life. And this picture of God is best seen in Jesus who gave it all. We shed his blood and we receive by faith and are made new. And so we're going to enter into a time of worship here in, in just a moment. But this is a, a time for response for us as well. And here's what we're going to do. You're here this morning. I know this has been kind of a heavier message, uh, but it's good for us to confront these things in our life. You're here this morning and, and you would say, Pastor, there are some things that I have allowed onto the throne that only God should occupy. There's some things in my life. Maybe it's an unrepented sin. Maybe it's addictions, habits that are not pleasing to God. Maybe it's uh, uh, maybe it's a wrong relationship. I mean, right, you, you know what it is. I don't want to start listing things because then if I don't list something you're dealing with, you go, oh, well, pastor didn't list it, so therefore it must not be bad. Okay, I know that happens. I've been there, I know, okay. So you know what's going on in your heart right now. You know the things that God throughout this message have been like pricking at your heart to say, yeah, this has become an idol in your life and you need to get it right. You need to let me destroy that God in your life 
so that I can be on the throne, the one, the only throne of your life. So if that's you this morning, then you would say, yeah, Pastor, there are things in my life that need to get right. Idols that have been built up in my life just need to be destroyed. And I'm ready to let Jesus, right, the one who by faith received his blood over our life, I'm ready to let Jesus do battle for me because he's come to destroy the works of the devil. Right? I'm ready to say, yeah, I need to give this to him. I'm just going to invite you to come on up uh, to the front and make these altars open. And we're going to be worshiping for just a little bit here. And so I don't want anybody to take off and leave, but come on down. Yeah, come on down. You're not going to be alone. Guarantee it, right? And nobody knows what you're coming down for, so it doesn't matter what you're coming down for. God knows your heart. Come on down. There are things in your life that you need to get right with him, things that you know have built up in your life. We're going to sing this song together, and I'm going to invite you to lift your hands up as you come down. You can find a place if you want to kneel down. That's fine as well. And any of our prayer team and any staff that we've got here this morning, if you can come on up, we're going to pray as well. Yeah, come down from the balcony. Uh, we've got uh, steps on either side. Go ahead and lead us. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and let's begin to sing and worship him this morning. A song about the altar, us coming to that altar. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we're in this moment. And God, I believe that your spirit is here. I believe, oh God, that you are doing some incredible work right now at these altars. God, I believe that you are in the process of removing idols, God, of, of removing other gods that are not you from these lives. And Lord, we are grateful for that. But folks, it all starts with Jesus. It really does. He is the only one who can set us free. He's the only, he's the Lamb of God who gave himself for us. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I, I haven't received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never trusted him with my whole life. I've never trusted him and I've never uh, by faith applied his blood over my life. Or perhaps maybe you have, but you've fallen away and you've just kind of allowed things to come into your life. If that's you this morning, say, I need Jesus in my life. Can you just very simply uh, lift your hand up to him? Thank you. Thank you. I see lots of hands up, folks. We're not alone. And just repeat after me, every one of us together here in the family of God. Just repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, take my life, broken as it is, 
forgive me of my sins. Make me new. I confess you as Lord of my life. And I choose you just like you chose me first. In Jesus' name, amen. Father God, I thank you for this morning. And God, we stand in this position of desperate need of you. God, for some who are here this morning, Lord, this this battle that has raged within them has raged for years in their life. And today, God, we ask for freedom. God, break chains this morning, oh God. We cannot do this on our own, but let the blood of Christ wash over us this morning. Because Jesus, we desperately need you. We desperately need you, Lord Jesus. We desperately need you, Jesus. We desperately need you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands to the Lord at this time. Father, we thank you. You are a great Savior, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing this together. What a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? See how it is. Christ is risen. Thank you, Jesus, you're risen. Bow down before. Yes, God, we surrender ourselves to you, Jesus. For he is Lord. You are Lord of all. Can you pray that over us? Sing hallelujah. Christ is Lord. Yes, you raise your hands. You raise your hands. Come on, let's sing that to him. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Lord, you're wonderful. Father, we thank you for this morning. And God, I thank you that you are just beginning that work in our lives. Father, as we have uh, come to you through Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you for the freedom that you bring us. And God, I thank you that you are going to complete this work. That God, you're going to take these confessions that we've made, God, these admissions of our own weakness and frailty and failure, and God, you're going to restore life through Jesus Christ to us. That the blood of Christ will be upon us and through us and in us. And that, Lord, your anointing will go with us as we leave from this place. And so, God, I thank you for the freedom that you bring. I thank you for Jesus Christ who gave himself on that cross so long ago for us, but whose power remains to this day. And, Lord, I thank you that your word says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and God, we give you all of the glory. So as we leave today, you can go knowing that Christ has set you free. He set you free. Now, there's work to do. Salvation is not earned. We don't work our way to salvation, right? The free gift of God is that eternal life in Christ Jesus. But now the difficult task is for us to stay on that track. Because we recognize that while God has defeated the gods, they're still going to vie for our attention for every one of us. And so as we go from this place, the Holy Spirit has strengthened us. That is that, uh, that by faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, we can stand strong in the Spirit. So, Father, thank you for today. Ask for your blessing upon your people as we go. Fill us with boldness. Fill us, O oh God, with confidence as we walk with you. And, uh, Lord, help us to represent you well as uh, you uh, have called us to lead the people of the valley to be more like Jesus. Help us to be more like you, Jesus, ourselves. In your name we pray.
Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning.